Devil May Cry is probably one of my favorite video game series ever. I think there's something to enjoy in every game, and there is an abundance of stylish action and cool boss battles. And today I am here to talk about my 10 favorite of those boss battles, because they are pretty awesome. So sit back, relax, get your pizza ready, and enjoy this video. It was my assumption that those demons would prove far inferior in the face of your tactics. In Devil May Cry 3, it is discovered that one of the main characters, Arkham, is a manipulative scumbag who likes to wear clown costumes. He eventually gets a hold of Sparta's sword, the Force Edge, and when you meet face to face with him, he is taken on the form of Dante's father, Sparta. So naturally the boss fight should be this really awesome duel between Dante and this image of his father, right? Nope. Wrong. It's... the... Uh, it's a blob. Great design choice, right? So apart from his rather poor design, what kind of moves does this boss have? Pretty much he has two. He'll swing at you with this long swipe with his arm, or he'll explode into these little pieces of... I don't even know what they are, they're kind of like horse heads and they'll bite at you. And you gotta take those out with your rocket launcher is the most effective way. You're probably thinking, Reaper, Reaper, Reaper. This doesn't sound like a very good boss fight, does it? And I would agree. But where this fight shines is right here. You should come to realize you cannot control the power of Sparta. You're wasting your time, buddy. I think he needs to learn the hard way. Heck yes, the Sons of Sparta are teaming up to destroy this poorly designed monstrosity. Now, the fight itself doesn't really change all that much, it's still just kind of smack him until he explodes into those things, but at least this time you have Virgil helping you. Now, I realize that this sounds kind of shallow and fanboyish, so as reasons to put this boss fight on the list, but in my opinion I do still think that the build up to this fight was done pretty well and I did actually want to fight Arkham, I just wasn't expecting him to you know, turn into a blob. That being said, this boss fight also has the sweetest finish ever. I'll try it your way for once. Remember what we used to say? <laughs> Jackpot. You summon and kill. Summon and kill. I fail to see the logic here. Fun fact Bolberg is the name that the Norse god Odin would use when masquerading as a human. On to the boss fight. This boss fight stands out among Devil May Cry 2's boss fights for being pretty intense. It was actually one that I found to be challenging compared to the rest of them. Odin uses a slew of different moves with his spear that will change in length all the time. You're also in a rather small room when you fight him, which complements the range of his weapon, and it keeps up the pace of the fight. His wolves, by the way, are actually kinda cool. They're minions in boss fights that don't bother me. Because they act smart. One time I was about to million stab Bolverk, and one of the wolves got in the way and blocked it for him, and it was really cool because the AI was acting intelligent. Anyway, Bolverk is a really intense fight, and it stood out among the rest of the Devil May Cry 2 bosses, and I had fun fighting him. It's not every day that you get to smack around the Pope in a video game, so this fight is pretty cool. Okay, Sanctus isn't really the Pope, but he is a religious leader in the town of Fortuna, and his villainous endeavors include kidnapping Kieri, um, duping Nero into being trapped into the Savior, and killing Kratos. This fight is preferable to the first Sanctus fight, because Sanctus actually fights back as opposed to the first fight where he's just a ragdoll for Nero to destroy. Sanctus uses a slew of different moves with the Sparta, and a few different fireball moves. One of my favorite things about the boss fights in Devil May Cry 4 that you play as Nero as are the different busters that you do, and this one is not an exception. This buster is awesome, especially in Devil Trigger. 
Actually, if you do a Devil Triggered Buster to finish Sanctus off, you get one of the coolest ends to a fight in the series. It's not every day that you get to smack around the Pope in a video game, so this fight is pretty cool. Okay, Sanctus isn't really the Pope, but he is a religious leader in the town of Fortuna, and his villainous endeavors include kidnapping Kieri, um, duping Nero into being trapped into the safe. So coming in at number 7, we have my favorite boss from the Devil May Cry reboot, Bob Barbus. Bob Barbus is pretty cool character-wise, too, as he's one of Mundus' main accomplices in enslaving humanity because he's Mundus' minister of propaganda. This, of course, reminded me of another news speaker very similar to Bob Barbus. I'm talking, of course, about Louis Prothero from V for Vendetta. Onto the fight itself, it's pretty cool. Bob will shoot these energy walls at you and you gotta jump through the holes in the energy walls to get to these switches placed around him. Once you hit all the switches, he'll be open to attack. After each burst of offense that you get off on him, you're sent into this newscast thing where you're fighting demons as Bob recounts all of Dante's criminal past. It's a pretty cool touch that adds to the gimmick of the fight. Overall, Bob Barbus was the most interesting and most fun boss to play in the Devil May Cry reboot, and that is why he takes number seven. A fact that tickles iron is judgment. Ha! And your judgments interest me not. For I am here to reclaim what is rightfully mine. You know, for one reason or another, Nightmare is a lot of people's least favorite boss in Devil May Cry 1. They cite him as being annoying and repetitive. I think it's actually a pretty intense battle. Seriously, Nightmare is like a demonic tank, complete with all sorts of attacks that are fun to parry and dodge and predict. These attacks consist of he's got these little machine gun circle things that if you stand in one place for too long will do significant damage to you. He's got these little spike things that will shoot out from wherever his core is that you can block with your machine guns and send them back at him. He's got a spear-like appendage that you can parry. He also uses that same appendage as a boomerang, and if you hit that, it will stun him as well. He also has an ice beam. And while this is a really easy attack to dodge, make sure you dodge it, because if you do not, it will be super effective. He also has this miniature level-like thing, where if you let him absorb you, you'll get dragged down into this really weird-looking area, and you kill a handful of the Sargassos, which are these skull things, and then after that you fight a severely nerfed version of one of the bosses from the previous area. It's not my favorite thing to do, but it is a good way to take a decent chunk out of his life. There are a few people who complain that Nightmare doesn't talk to you like Phantom or Griffin did before and after your fights, but... I don't care because it's the intensity of the fight and the diverse moveset that he has that sells me on how fun the boss fight really is. And that's why he takes number six on this list. That is what you think. Alright, so coming in at number five, we have the Fire and Wind Twins, Agni and Rudra from DMC3. While I was playing DMC3, to refresh my opinions about the bosses and everything, I played on very hard, and when I got to these guys, they completely thrashed me. Repeatedly. And you wanna know what? I had fun. Every single time. Seriously, when a boss is so much fun that you can enjoy yourself when you lose as much as you enjoy yourself when you win, I think that speaks volumes about how much enjoyability the fight actually has. They also get bonus points for being funny. Brother, our guest is Sai. Sai? What is Sai? Well, a so Moving on to the things that actually happen during the fight, this fight consists of two enemies with two health bars, and that sounds kind of unfair, but it actually is more balanced than you think it might be. It's actually really easy to manage 
dodging both of them, and it becomes a lot of fun. Agni and Rudra both have their own special elemental attacks that they'll use frequently. Their main pattern consists of running to one end of the room and then running it where you're at and then doing this jumping stab or slash thing. One of my favorite things to do personally in this fight is to uh, clash with them and if you do it enough times in a row by timing your strikes correctly, you'll eventually make them drop their sword and then you can attack them with little resistance. Just make sure you watch out for the other brother because he'll interrupt your clash and try to attack you. If you dodge it right, you can end up making them attack each other, which is a lot of fun. One of the standout features of this boss fight is that when you kill one brother, the other one will take the fallen brother's sword and start dual wielding. This adds a really big increase to difficulty. Now if you don't want the challenge of fighting the dual wielding brother, then just whittle their health down pretty much evenly the entire time, and if you keep it balanced enough throughout, you'll be able to kill the other one before he can even pick up the f first one's sword. After Dante defeats Agni and Rudra, they kind of strike a bit of a funny deal. Dante agrees to take them with him on one condition. Okay, but on one condition. What is it? Name it! No, talking! And that is why I wait in your Alright, number four is the savior. And before we move on to the fight, there's one very, very crucial piece of information you have to know about this boss. <laughs> Check it out! It's got wings! Okay, so the savior is a giant godlike statue that is made up of the many souls of the demons that the Order of the Sword has been capturing over the years. And it's being powered by Nero, you know, the guy who was smacking around the Pope earlier. So, needless to say, this thing is pretty threatening. Something that I want to throw in that I noticed personally when I played through this fight a couple times was that this fight actually reminds me a bit of a God of War boss, except without all the quick time event nonsense. It's just massive and you're climbing all around it and stuff. Anyway, on to the actual process of the fight. Pretty much what you do is he, the savior has a whole bunch of jewels on him, and you gotta take those out for the first stage, and it will take you quite a bit of time getting them all broken and stuff, stunning him. There's all sorts of different things you can do. There's a few, there's like a cannon thing, if you can find it. There's a laser thing that if he punches it, you'll be stunned. You can even climb on him in a few instances. So after destroying the smaller, less important jewels around the savior, the traditional boss fight with the health bar starts when you just have his final one in the center of his chest to destroy. During this part of the fight, the savior will bust out this really cool, like, laser death ray thing. It's really easy to dodge, and if you just go to one of the platforms that launch you to a different platform, you'll be safe, but it still looks really cool. He will also start chaining together more things, like instead of just doing one little sweep slap that he does, he'll do, like, slap, slap, and then he'll start kicking you, which is really cool. Because, you know, seeing a giant statue bust out some kicks is really interesting. Eventually there will be instances where you do enough damage to the savior to get him stunned, which in turn lets you take advantage of that opportunity to go to his core and do a lot of heavy damage to him. For me, I end up finishing him off after stunning him about two or three times. Speaking of finishing him off, the way that Dante puts an end to this fight is really awesome. Solid. Take it out from the inside. <laughs> you will fumble the composition of my quest. Oh, where do I begin? The third duel with Nello Angelo 3 is atmospheric, intense, challenging, and overall just a lot of fun to play. Dante had already fought Nello Angelo twice before in Devil May Cry 1, and he even remarked about how he was surprised that Nello Angelo had enough guts to face him head to head. Now this duel is a lot cooler because it happens in the dark of night, and then Nello Angelo takes off his helmet to reveal his face. It turns out he was the ghost of Albert Wesker. 
Only kidding. Later, after the fight, we learn that he is, in fact, Dante's brother, Virgil. Moving on to the fight itself, it plays like the other two Nello fights, except he adds a new move to his repertoire, that being the Summon Swords, which are definitely interesting and can be a pain to dodge sometimes. My favorite thing to do in this fight, and the other Nello fights for that matter, is to time my strikes well and get into a sword clash with him. If you time it well enough, you'll eventually end up stunning him and then you can deliver a combo to him. Just be careful because he likes to hit you out of nowhere a lot. One of my favorite aspects of this fight is the true battle of equals feel it has. In every other boss in Devil May Cry 1 is a lot bigger than Dante. You're either fighting a giant spider, or a big bird, or a giant slimy tank. In this fight, and the other Nello fights for that matter, it is just a duel with another swordsman. And I think that is really cool. And it makes it all the more satisfying when you hit that final strike on him. The reward you get for beating Nello Angelo, by the way, is by far and away the best sword in Devil May Cry, in my opinion. I encourage for an opportunity to battle a being of such grand delusion as you. So, coming in at number two, we have the Lord of the Underworld himself, Mundus. Now, Devil May Cry has never really been known for its story, but I do think that the first game did get the point across that Dante wants his revenge on the demon that killed his mother and brother. That being said, Dante's father also fought this demon 2,000 years ago and beat him. So there definitely is a story to have between the two. And when Dante finally gets to enact his revenge at the end of Devil May Cry 1, I was definitely invested in it. Mundus was also built as pretty threatening in the cutscene before his fight, because without even turning into the form that he's fighting you in, he shot these little laser things at you, and Dante was really hurt. Oh yeah, and he killed Trish. The fight itself is a two-stage battle, with the first stage being an on-rail shooter type thing. In space. Okay, enough fun being made. This part of the fight was actually pretty good for what it was. I think it played decently enough for being completely different from how the rest of the game played, and I actually thought it was pretty intense. During this, pretty much, you gotta dodge all of Mundus' attacks and shoot away his shield. And your devil trigger in this is not an actual mode, it is an attack. You get to shoot a giant fire dragon at him, and it is awesome! The second phase of this fight has Mundus chilling out in this lava crater while he combats you with a slew of all sorts of moves. He's got these machine gun orbs that go around in circles and will knock you out if you get hit by them. I swear, those things were the bane of my existence in DMD. He also has his own fire dragon that he summons, and if you kill that, you get a green orb for your troubles. He uses Phantom's flaming face columns from that fight. And his one of his most deadly attacks is his little three ball laser move, which can be parried and sent back at him, which I didn't know for the longest time. Another cool point of this fight is that you get to utilize the Sparta's Devil Trigger, which pretty much makes your sword 20 feet long and you get to shoot fireballs from your hands as guns when you're in that mode. Once you finally put Mundus away, he tries to like fly up and escape and then he disintegrates. So overall, the build-up to this fight was pretty good, and the fight itself was really intense, which is good enough to land this fight at number two. All throughout this countdown, I have described boss battles with atmosphere, intensity, difficulty, and are overall just a lot of fun to play. Number one is no exception, in fact number one has all of these elements gift wrapped it into a nice little package with a bow on it. I am of course talking about the final battle with Virgil in Devil May Cry 3. This is probably one of the hardest fights in the series, and for me it's also the most fun. Virgil uses an entire slew of attacks consisting of combinations of using Yamato and Force Edge. He uses the Dimension Slash, he uses Rapid Slash, he uses the Stinger. If you attack him and he dodges, he normally just falls from the sky and combos you and it really, really hurts. This fight really does require that you have your dodging perfected or Virgil is going to absolutely rock your world. In fact, I can almost find a lot of amusement in just dodging his infinite Dimension Slash when he does the, uh, 
ghost devil trigger and just disappears and you're being dimension slashed repeatedly. Dodging around that just makes my heart rate rise so much. It is intense. You can do the whole clashing method like in Agni and Rudra and uh, as I also mentioned in Nello Angelo's fights, but that's likely to go sour really quickly because Virgil is likely to just rapid slash you after two or three times or teleport and attack you from the sky. Another aspect of this fight that I really enjoy is the battle of equals element is brought up again. That is really good since the main plot point of Devil May Cry 3 is the feud between Dante and Virgil. And it, this fight does kind of come full circle in the end because in the first fight with Virgil you get completely destroyed and the second fight is a draw and then this is the fight where you finally overcome him. The atmosphere and tone of this fight is really awesome too. In the previous mission, we just saw how well Dante and Virgil could work together with one another. But now Virgil's lust for power drove him to try and take Dante's amulet, and he stole the Force Edge. This has Dante oppose him in order to save the world. And this is the fight where their brotherly feud goes from just being a family feud and transcends into being a battle for the fate of the world instead. I think the battle theme does a good job at getting the atmosphere across, too, because unlike, you know, most of Devil May Cry's soundtrack that is just a bunch of heavy metal, this one is a fully instrumentalized orchestra piece that really does sound like something grave is at stake. If you win, you saved the world, but you also killed your brother, and then if you lose, Virgil takes over the world. The last time I played this fight, I thought it was paced perfectly. It took me like 15 minutes to do, but it was still paced really well for me. It felt like there really was a grand sword clash in the underworld going on right in front of me, and when I finally sank my sword into him for the last time, it felt I felt like, wow, I just did something really awesome. And that is what makes Virgil 3 my favorite boss fight in the Devil May Cry series. Thank you for watching.